Chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of so many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Christ is born. Christ has come into the world as a little child. My eyes have seen your salvation, said Simeon, when he saw the baby Jesus and that holy family that day in the temple so many years ago. God has come into the world to save us all from sin and death. Christ is born. Like Simeon, like Anna, we all get to see Christ with our own eyes. When we participate in a service of baptism like we just did today, we see the presence of Christ in each other. In the Gospel of Luke, we read that after that first holy night when Christ was born, shepherds and angels came and told Mary and Joseph that their son was the Savior of the world. And in today's scripture, in chapter 2 of the book of Luke, we read of what happened just eight days later after that first night of Christ's birth. In keeping with the Jewish custom established in Leviticus 12, Mary and Joseph took the infant Jesus to the temple of Jerusalem to have him dedicated to God. They were tired from their journey and the birth of their child, but they traveled the six miles from Bethlehem. The infant Christ was to be circumcised. And in this way, Mary and Joseph would follow the law of Moses. As they entered the temple, they probably thought of the story of Hannah, who so many years before had dedicated her firstborn son, Samuel, to God. We know that Mary and Joseph were poor because the sacrifice they offered was not a sheep. It was a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. I imagine that day that Mary and Joseph felt a strong sense of love for each other, love for God, and love for their baby son, Jesus. I think that it is appropriate that this Sunday, in the Christmas season, many of us are here with our families, with our parents, with our brothers and sisters, with our grandparents, and here together with, with our church family. In seeing you here today, I see Christ within all of you. I wonder what was going through the minds of Mary and Joseph that day. I, I uh, don't have many, I don't have any children myself, but uh, one of the things that has been tremendously inspiring for me during the, my months here at this church is to see how so many young couples have made the decision to have their children baptized, to say that, yes, I want the presence of Jesus to be within the life of my children. But I've always wondered, 
what goes on in the mind of parents that Sunday, that fateful Sunday when it's time to have the child baptized? You might think, what surprise is in store for us today? I think that um, here's a couple things that I thought might be a surprise that you might be thinking about. You might think, well, maybe if it's a, if it's a baby, maybe the child is just going to make a whole bunch of crazy sounds, and they're going to wiggle and squirm and things like that. And it, I mean, that, that could be a surprise. Or maybe the child will be a little bit shy, and um, whenever the child is handed to the pastor and, and is going to be walked around and shown to everyone that the child will be, you know, kind of scared and, and trying to get out of the pastor's hands. You know, what, what surprises could come that day? Um, with the permission of, of my parents, I'd like to share with you the story of, of my baptism. I was baptized as, as a little boy, uh, less than a year old, and, um, but none of those surprises happened. I, I, was, I was, according to my parents, very happy. I was giggling and, and uh, squirming and things like that. And I wasn't afraid of the, the pastor. The, the pastor who baptized me was actually my grandfather. Uh, Don Wandell was a United Methodist minister. And so apparently I was just smiling and happy as they put the water on my head and, you know, they said the words that baptized me, dedicating my life to God. But um, there was a surprise that day. After I was baptized and handed back to my parents, my father holding me in his hands looked down and uh, saw what the cause of all of my my happiness, my, my giggles were. The cause of that was running down the sleeve of his brand new white Easter suit. <laughs> Mary and Joseph had a big surprise that day in the temple whenever they took their son to be dedicated to God. They'd probably been saying, we, we've been through so much. We, we've, we've traveled so far. We've had angels come to visit us. We've had shepherds. We've had so many surprises happen already in our lives. What more? What more is going to surprise us here today? There was a man in the temple of Jerusalem that day, and his name was Simeon. And he had been waiting for the consolation of Israel. He had been waiting for God's salvation. You see, uh, the people of Israel had been conquered and oppressed for many generations, first by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians who had taken them into exile. And at the time that this story is, uh, is written, the people of Israel were controlled by the Roman Empire. Simeon was praying with all of his heart for the consolation of Israel. He was praying that his people would be set free in a very political, in a very real sense. He was praying to God and asking for God to bring them salvation. That day, the Holy Spirit moved Simeon. The Holy Spirit had told Simeon that he would see with his eyes the Savior of the people of Israel, and the Savior of the whole world. The Holy Spirit called him into the temple that day. And as he was in the temple, he looked across those long halls, and there he saw the holy family, Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Simeon, an old man, ran as fast as he could with his stiff legs, ran across the hall, and then out of Mary's arms, grabbed the baby Jesus, and holding him up, he praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. I bet Mary and Joseph were surprised at that. Imagine how you would feel If you brought your son or daughter to church, you uh, take them carefully out of the back seat of your car and and hold their hand as you walk in through the parking lot and into the atrium, that room with all the glass, and then all of a sudden one of our greeters in, in a red shirt runs up to you and they grab your son, they grab your daughter and hold them up and say, your son, your daughter is going to do big things for God. Your child is going to be a part of God's kingdom here on earth. How would that make you feel? I mean, you'd be surprised, you'd be kind of startled, but I bet that it would make you feel confirmation that God loves your child, that God knows your child by name and has plans for them. So imagine how Mary and Joseph felt that day whenever Simeon came up to them and told them that their son 
was going to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, their son, even more than that, was going to be the savior of the whole world. Do you think that Mary and Joseph ever got used to the way that God would speak to them through complete strangers? Early in the book of Luke, we read that the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her that she is going to hold in her womb the Savior of the whole cosmos. And then that night that Christ is born, these shepherds come from the hills of Palestine. They come out of nowhere, and they tell them that their son is the Savior. They've come to see their baby, that the angels told them. And the shepherds, they sing the song of the angels. They say, glory to God in the highest heaven, the Savior, the Messiah, is born. And now Simeon tells Mary and Joseph here in the temple that their son is the Savior, the Savior of the people of Israel, the Savior of the whole world. He tells us who Jesus really is. You see, Jesus himself is salvation. Simeon in the temple represents that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. You see, God had sent people over the centuries, to speak to God's people. And these prophets said that God would be the God of the Hebrew people, that God would bring them salvation. But we read that Christ is even more than the salvation of the Hebrew people. Christ is the salvation of who? All people, all the world. Simeon's message is consistent with the prophet Isaiah, who in the uh, 49th chapter, verse 6, writes this, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to rise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. You see, God had intended from the beginning that all of the families of the world would be blessed by Christ. Simeon also embodies the joy that we feel whenever we encounter Christ for the first time. Do you remember a time when you saw Christ? I had the opportunity to be a hospital chaplain at Children's Medical Center in Dallas. I was invited many times to sit with families as they prayed to God, asking for healing and wellness for their children as they recovered from major illnesses and injuries. Over the course of the summer that I was a hospital chaplain, I spent a good deal of time with a family whose daughter was in considerable pain. Her condition worsened to the point where she was unable to understand what was going on around her. Her parents and her brothers and sisters were absolutely exhausted as they lived and slept in the hospital. But slowly, as the days and the weeks passed, she started to recover. And I remember one day seeing her get in the back seat of her parents' car as they drove away from the hospital. In that moment of joy, I saw Christ. But Simeon has a second message for Mary and Joseph. Simeon says that Simeon says that uh, the the, doesn't just talk about the joy that he brings, but says to, to Mary that the pain will come as part of as part of the life of Jesus. He says that your your child is destined for the rising and the falling of many in Israel. And this image calls to mind the image of the stone in the book of Isaiah that is both the cornerstone of the temple and the stone that is rejected by the builders. Simeon reminds us that even in this moment of intense joy, Christ's life involves suffering and death. This suffering and hardship is for Christ, for Christ's mother, and for the followers of Christ. Simeon tells Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul too. Many see this statement as the foreshadowing of the pain that Mary will experience when she witnesses Christ's death on a cross. 
Do you remember a time when you saw Christ? During my time as a hospital chaplain, I was invited to be with families in the last moments of the lives of their children. After the wait was over, I would walk with them to their car, and we would pray one more time as they left the hospital. In those moments of unspeakable suffering and pain, I could see the presence of Christ with these families. You see, Christ was with them there in their suffering. And then in this moment at the temple of surprise and joy and foreboding, another person comes up to the young family. An old woman whose name is Anna rushes up to them and praises God for all of her life, she has spent this time in the temple praying and fasting, fasting and praying. She has been praying for the consolation of Israel. And when she sees Jesus, we read that she's moved out of her excitement to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. She tells the parents and us as the readers more about who Jesus is. He is the Savior. Have you ever met anyone like Anna before? Someone who's just so filled with joy for the love that they have for Jesus. Now, I want to tell you a story really quick about someone who, who I met in my life who really reminded me of Anna. I lived several years ago in the country of South America, in the country of Colombia. I moved to the city of Cartagena, and there I, I taught English for about a year. The first couple days that I was there, I was walking the beautiful city streets of Cartagena. It's a, it's a colonial town. You don't need a car to get around. I was very lost. I was looking, looking at my map, and luckily a young man had mercy on me. His name was Manuel. He helped me to find where I was going. And, but here's one thing that I was just really impressed with him, is that just in that first few moments that we were talking with each other, he told me about his genuine love for God. He asked me about my faith and let me know that Jesus loved me. We went on to become friends that year, and he witnessed to me through his church and, and through many other things. Manuel reminded me of Anna, of that just genuine joy and love for Christ. We are all called to follow Anna as evangelists. When we encounter Christ, as all of us who are here today have, we ought to be moved by this experience to go out and to share that love and that joy with others to tell other people the story of Christ, to tell them about his saving grace, about his mighty acts, about his love, and about his vulnerability. To me, this story of Jesus as an infant in the temple is so powerful because it describes him in his vulnerability. As a baby held in the arms of his mother, of Simeon, and Anna, this story about Jesus shows us who he is. You see, God chose to be born into the world as a human. God chose to be born into the world as a baby. We often think about Jesus as a strong young man preaching against hatred and hypocrisy. But you see, Christ's ministry starts even before he's able to speak. And I think that this is the way that Christ works within our lives. In moments of love and tenderness, Christ comes to us where we are. Through moments of our own vulnerability, Christ brings us peace and salvation. And through this, we are reminded that we need Christ for our salvation. Mary and Joseph stood in the temple of Jerusalem with Simeon, and Anna, and many other people. They were parents of poor and humble backgrounds, but they were told that, yes, their son was the savior of the world. Thanks be to God.